Yeah. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of The Good and the Bad of Black Grad. My name is Ian Worley, and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies. And we are delighted that you have joined us here today. It is also essential, especially today, that we recognize and acknowledge that this symposia or this event is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. CAGS and those gathered here today honor all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. I would now like to turn things over to the series producer and host, Dr. Evelyn Esiadu. Evelyn, take it away. Thanks, Ian, and thanks everyone for being here. I am so excited to do episode four of this webinar series, The Good and the Bad of Black Grad. Um, in addition to the housekeeping items that Ian has mentioned, I just want to remind everybody that this series was born out of um, the ideas of many Black academics really wanting to give us a space to, to voice our opinions and share our experiences with each other, but also to, to enlighten those who um, might not otherwise be able to get a uh, perspective on these intermittent conversations. And um, so I think that this, this series does a lot, but also allows people to be better allies. So, so thanks for everyone for coming. Um, also, this episode is brought to you by NSERC. So that's pretty cool. Um, we'd like to acknowledge the support of the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Nous um, remercions les conseils de recherche en sciences naturelles et en génie du Canada. Um, so that's my French for today. Won't be doing that again. Um, also going to say that everything that's said in this room, the thoughts and, and feelings and opinions are, are of the panelists, and we're so thankful that they've taken the time to do this. Um, and as Ian had said, we do welcome questions and, and hope for an engaging discussion, but um, we will not be tolerant of any harmful or uh, disrespectful questions or comments, and hate speech is not to tolerated at all. Um, and so that's pretty much it. Those are all the, the quick, fun, necessary things to do. And we'll just get right into it. I'm going to start by doing a nice and quick, just round the table, getting us to know who our panelists are. So I'm going to go in alphabetical order, two minutes or less elevator pitch. Let's make it one minute or less elevator pitch. Uh, Fal Bennett, who are you? What do you do? Why are you here? All the questions. Okay, so I was actually going to tell you, ask if we could bring it down to a minute anyways. Um, but yeah, so my name is Fallon Bennett. People call me Fal, and I am a recent graduate from the University of Toronto's Dalana School of Public Health, um, MPH program, which is their Master of Public Health, and I studied social and behavioral health sciences. So throughout my degree, I was really focused on Black health, Black communities, health, equity, health justice. And as of right now, I'm working on research in Dr. Arjman Siddiqui's social epidemiology lab. So I'm really interested in using quantitative methods to explore reproductive justice, um, what that means for Black women, Black birthing persons, and how we can achieve that in the Canadian context. So I could talk about that for like hours, but I'll just keep it there. So aside from doing all of that, I'm also one of two co-founders and co-leaders of this organization called um, Grad Schooling While Black, which is basically an organization where we support Black applicants in getting into grad school and then getting through grad school. And I can also talk about that later. But yeah, so aside from the community work I do and the various research projects that I overcommit myself to, <laughs> um, right. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so thank you, everybody. Oh, well, thanks, Val. And um, if you could just uh, drop those that information about grad schooling while black in the chat for everybody, be super helpful. So welcome and thank you. Next on the hit list, Zara Hassan. Hello. Hello. Um, I don't think that's alphabetical order, but it's maybe... not. Why? Maybe by last name. Well, yeah, maybe... by last name. Okay, sorry. Yeah, by last name. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Zara. Um, my name is Zara Hassan, and I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm currently a doctoral candidate in education policy studies in the Faculty of Education um, in um, University of Alberta. And my research looks at young adult refugees and access to post-secondary education. So I'm looking at um, young refugees between the ages of 20 and 30 
at the time of resettlement in Canada and how they are accessing and navigating uh, post-secondary education. And um, so, yeah, so that's why basically my doctoral research. I have a lot of community work background, originally from Toronto, and I did my master's in, in Ottawa. And I also lectured this year at the University of Alberta um, in um, two courses um, around ad Indigenous history, race, racism, um, gender and class. So essentially that's uh, in a nutshell, a little bit about me. Um, also, I just wanted to mention part of the Black Graduate Student Association, University of Alberta, and we do a lot of work around um, advocating for a better environment for Black students. And that's how I know Evelyn. Glad to be here. So glad you're here, Zara. Don't sleep on Zara. Zara's been doing one million things since I knew her. She's always so busy. When I say don't sleep on Zara, I mean that she's amazing. And also she probably doesn't sleep. So thank you for giving us 90 minutes of your time. Um, and if you can also just drop some information about um, the Black Graduate Students Association for people to, to find and share, uh, Zara, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Last but not least, of course, we have Michael. Hello. Who are you? Why are you? All of the things. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michael JJ. I'm uh, from Windsor, Ontario, and I attend the University of Windsor. Um, where I did my bachelor's degree and where I'm currently a PhD candidate. Um, so my bachelor's was originally in biochemistry, but then I switched my um, my research focus to uh, materials chemistry for my doctorate. Uh, and I'm a PhD candidate in the um, Rondo Gagne research group, um, working on stretchable, soft, self-healable um, organic electronics for um, applications in uh, wearable electronics. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're basically a big nerd like myself. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. you're a chemist. We're all, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> We're all nerds, but I mean, chemistry is um, t the cream of the crop of the nerds. I found you through the Black Canadian uh, Students, Black Canadian Scientist Network, um, just for everybody's information. <clears> that <throat> is a yeah. um, nonprofit organization which I have been so happy to have been connected with. And so, I kind of just creeped their website and then I saw your face and I'm like, maybe this guy will talk to me. And then you did. So thank you for being here. Yeah, Amazing. Course, no so problem. now we know, <laughs> absolutely. We know a little bit about everybody now. And um, as Ian had mentioned, you know, um, this year, um, above all years, but I mean, it's never, never too early to start. We recognize that um, we are all on indigenous land. And so uh, speaking of which, um, tomorrow is uh, the day for truth and reconciliation first official day um, in our country. And so um, to start off, what what or is any any of your institutions doing anything for for this day? Um, anyone can jump in before I start picking on people. Um, I could start. Um, so we are um, the Truth and Reconciliation Day. Is, uh, it's a federal holiday, but obviously um, the provinces have a choice whether to recognize it or not. Luckily for the in our province, obviously in Alberta, we um, it's not a holiday. It's not a provincial holiday. So most people are working, but the University of Alberta has accepted it as a uh, or adopted it as a holiday. So there is no school tomorrow. There are no classes or anything to that effect. But there's a number of initiatives that are taking place. I'm actually going to an event right after this around what um, you know regular Canadians can do uh, in regards to establishing a better relationship with Indigenous people and the 94 calls to action. So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, also in my faculty, we're being encouraged to wear orange shirts and share our, our stories around um, Indigenous hist history, residential schools, and anything else that we're doing or working towards. Awesome. Yes, orange shirts, just like the one in the background and the one I am wearing, fashion and also contributing to social justice. Um, Val, going to pick on you next. Do you know if um, your community or the U of T is doing anything? Yeah, so U of T is a really big school, as everybody knows. So different like institutes and schools are working with this and dealing with everything in different ways. So Dala Lana um, actually is putting on a few events from what I know of throughout the week. Um, we also have the Wakaness Bryce Institute, which is the institute that handles like the indigenous health program and stuff like that. So for example, there are like showings of different documentaries, different discussions being held. I think tomorrow there will also be 
a March, but it could be today as well. So Dalalana um, and Ryan Hines, who's actually our equity and diversity person, he together with the Wakanis Bryce Institute and the other indigenous communities in the area are doing hosting a few events. As for the larger school, I'm not sure. And also as for like the medical school, nursing school, like the law school, I don't know. But yeah, so that's what yeah, no, that's fair. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Val. I mean, like you are just a, a former student there. I I don't uh, ask you guys as spokes spokespeople of the university, but I figured you know if if you knew, it, it's helpful to share. So thanks for sharing that, um, Michael. What are they doing at Windsor? Uh, there are a few things that I'm aware of. So the first one, um, which is happening tomorrow, is I think they're doing a uh, what's it called? An Every Child Matters or sorry, Every Child Healing Walk. Yeah, um, from one to six is going from right along the riverfront because Windsor is right across the Detroit River. Um, so there's like a walk from, I think the university all the way down to Assumption College. Um, there's also another one that, there's a seminar I think my supervisor sent to me this morning actually. Uh, sorry, that's a chemistry one. Uh, but okay, yeah, here it is. There's another, uh, there's a seminar, um, a new feature in education. A seminar, which basically is talking about what needs to be changed about the way history is taught in uh, in grade school, so that people are made more aware of uh, Indigenous history. And then finally, I think there is a there's a virtual seminar that's being held at the Paul Martin Law Library, which is like our our local law library for the law school, um, which is talking about the history of residential schools. I think. Yeah, so those are things that I that I know about. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, and I think thank you all again for sharing. And I think it's important to share in this room so that we don't forget. It's we're talking about inclusive excellence as we slide into that discussion. I think it's important for us to all acknowledge that you know we are uh, all settlers here. I um, myself uh, over the last few months have moved. I no longer live in Edmonton, so can't harass Zara at every turn. I now live in Kamloops, BC. So I'm at Thompson Rivers University and uh, our university will be observing the holiday. Today, we also will be having a number of events led by um, Indigenous education and um, um, a, num a number of Indigenous leaders on campus. And so I, right after this, also will be um, taking part in, in those events. And I'm really excited that um, this is finally a holiday. I mean, we could get into that, but um, we don't have to. So hopefully everybody takes some time tomorrow to, to do their part. And um, I have a number of things on my reading list, including this, An Inconvenient Idiot, which I hear is a very good book. It looks reverse in my camera, but hopefully it's not reversed in your cameras. Um, so just anything really to, to educate ourselves uh, is important. So um, uh, we should actually take a poll. Let's take a breath and just do a poll of the people who are in this room. Eli, um, if you could, Great book, thanks, Mel. I know, right? I, that's what I've heard. I can't wait to read it. Eli, if we can, we're gonna do two polls in succession. The first poll question being, oh, is it you, Ian? Yeah, I'll do the polls. Uh... Okay, thank you. Sorry, my bad. <clears throat> so, first question is, everybody in the room, thanks for joining us. Um, who are you? We just want to know um, from what segment of the population you're coming, so our um, audience members can uh, just be informed and tailor their answers uh, accordingly. Uh, oftentimes we have a nice even split between all these different um, group members. And so that's, that's nice. So um, yeah, Ian always usually waits for as many people as possible to answer. We're um, at 82%. Uh, okay, great. I think we shut it down at 95 and then move on. And then the next question we'll ask after this one is about what people are doing in their communities for, for TRC day. Um, so we all okay. have a little bit of an idea. Uh, okay. And let's share results. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. So there's more students and staff here than faculty and general audience members. So thank you everybody for being here. It's so nice to, to have you all here. So now you guys know who's in the room. Um, we also want to know what do you guys in the audience, what do you, what will you be doing or what are your communities doing um, for TRC day? Is that the question that I asked? Um, uh, the second poll? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Do you have the day off to reflect? Yes, no, maybe, maybe so. And then if not, um, what do I say? If not, is your workplace institution hosting events for reflection and engagement with the indigenous community? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so yeah, 
can't not ask these questions, you know, tomorrow, September 30th, which when I first planned this um, webinar series, um, I think that was one of the dates we had thrown out, like I, I, in terms of like suggesting for when to, to meet. And so between then and now it's become an, a holiday, which is kind of, kind of crazy. And, and so, so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're at 82%. Okay. Give it like 10 more seconds and we're going to shut it down. Okay. No, 84. <laughs> Ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Ooh, it's almost, yeah, okay. Most, most, uh, it looks like most institutions are having the day off, which is interesting. It's 60 40 split. Um, and of those who do not, looks like most, most of the, communities are are doing things with indigenous community on, on campus or, or in their community. So that's good. That's good. So it looks like at least within the people in this room that it is being um, observed or acknowledged in some way. So I'm, I'm really glad to know that. Okay, so we're going to just breeze on by to the reason why well, this theme that we're here to do today, um, inclusive excellence. Uh, this is a term and expression that I've been hearing more and more, I think, as a result of the, the last 18 months, you know, Black Lives Matter, academia recognizing that they're not very um, inclusive, I guess. Uh, white supremacist, whatever you want to say. Um, and so this is a phrase I'm hearing more and more. And so just to get us kind of warmed up in a, in a few words, um, what does what does that mean to you or what doesn't it mean to you? Um, let me see what the, the actual question I wrote is so it doesn't throw anybody off. Um, yeah, um, just general thoughts about inclusive excellence. Um, anybody can jump in here. Maybe I'll start with Michael because I haven't picked on him first yet. Sure. So basically what um, inclusive excellence means to me, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yes, please. Yeah, well, inclusive excellence, I think my conception of it has sort of changed over the last few um, years, right? Um, I think for the most part, it means, you know, celebrating excellence that's not from traditional means, <clears throat> right? So basically we have this idea that, um, to be excellent is sort of, it's sort of like a, a way to justify being like alive, I guess, right? Because, you know, we have to say black excellence. Um, that's the reason why we have to occupy this, these spaces because we're excellent, but it's like, why do you need to be excellent to, to occupy the space? Why can't you just be, you know, just being black in itself and surviving basically and getting to where you're at, that should be excellent enough or, you know, things like that. So yeah, that's kind of, me kind of spitballing there but yeah no that's yeah. great great first start and tying into black excellence which is our next question yeah. so gonna pick on foul next inclusive excellence what do you think yeah so i agree with michael and i know that i've shared these thoughts with a few people a few different times that for me over the years it's definitely been a dynamic concept i think at the very beginning especially like when i was in high school which seems like years ago you know it's like oh like excellence academic excellence getting per near perfect grades if not perfect doing all the volunteer work and stuff like that and as i sort of became older and delved more into my own readings readings from black and indigenous authors it occurred to me that just being able to survive in like white supremacist conditions the society that we live in in and of itself is excellence right so for me that is what inclusive excellence is it's celebrating as you said michael honoring respecting people wherever they are and just acknowledging that any any movement any piece of happiness you find as a black person as an indigenous person is a move towards excellence amen finger snaps girl um, okay, we're going to move on to Zara. What do you think? Um, yeah, I totally agree with uh, what Val and Michael both have said. Um, you know, working for me, working in the EDI circles, you see this in many of the documents, institutional documents about inclusive excellence and talking about how diversity and inc inclusion and including different perspectives is what makes an institution or a community um, um, excellent. And I think um, I do agree with that, but at the same time, 
I feel that it's becoming a little bit of buzzword uh, word in those circles, just because you you might want you know you might be increasing student um, you know div diverse in, in students in your institutions or faculty members. But the question is, what are you doing to really include them? What are you doing to ensure that their voices are being heard and that they are excelling and thriving in a healthy way in a white you know, wide dominated spaces. So for me, it's more than just having people um, increasing or including uh, people, but really including them in a meaningful way and not just individuals, but different ways of knowing, different ways of, uh, um, uh, different ways of um, understanding what excellence is and what knowledge is, especially since we're talking about higher education in grad school. So, yeah. Jesus, Sarah, just coming in hot, dropping in knowledge, dropping in facts. Yes, exactly. This is why I love these conversations. Like when we when we all chatted a couple of weeks ago, almost a month ago now, so crazy, just really challenging ourselves to, to, to think in different ways. Like for myself personally, inclusive excellence, like I said before, was a phrase that I've been seeing in a lot of these university documents, strategic plans and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, what? But like, what is it? And and for who and for what purpose. And so um, I agree. I think it's a discussion about um, like generally who's in included, I guess, in, in, in ways, but also what do we value? Uh, what do we value as researchers? What do we value as a community? What do we value in, in the university? I actually just learned yesterday um, from my colleague, um, Tamina uh, Kaja, Kaja? Um, and she was a postdoctoral fellow at Vancouver Island University and let me know that there are actually there's actually like a, a conglomerate of universities who have agreed to principles of how to make their universities more equitable and more inclusive so I've just dropped that link in the chat but um, if these universities are doing this thing on the side and the people who are supposed to impact myself everybody all of my panelists in this room if we don't know what the heck they're talking about in terms of inclusive excellence then there's obviously a disconnect and that's why these conversations need to happen um i think just just going to follow up with you Fal, in terms of the the dynamics that you've been faced with in terms of this this term um uh, inclusive excellence uh, specifically black excellence um wondering your thoughts on if and or how that relates to black girl magic and or black boy joy and for those people in the room, maybe just giving a, a brief cursory review of what those those ideas are, please. Yeah, so I think often, and I say this as somebody who born and raised in Toronto, grew up in Toronto, spent my whole life here. So mm -hmm. my views reflect that. Absolutely. Um, but especially like when I was growing up, I went to a predominantly Italian school um, and a predominantly white neighborhood. And Black people were not recognized for anything except like athletics, um, if that, sometimes music, dance. And I remember like Black History Month, for example, the only time throughout my entire elementary school journey where Black History Month was even celebrated was when they brought up a Black hockey player. So I think, Ooh, yeah, very it was nice. vividly. So I think growing up in that circumstance, especially as a TDSB student, you get to the point where you just, you want to see Black representation, right? When it comes to medicine, law, politics, wherever you can get it, sort of like you start craving it. So I think that's sort of how my dynamics went along, where I went from not seeing Black people take up any space in a positive manner, to then really craving to see Black people, period, in any light. Um, and then beginning to realize how that affects what's expected of me, what's expected of my community, how much work we're expected to do compared to other races to be seen as um, like half as good. Um, and yeah, so I think when you hear ideas like black excellence and even like black girl joy and sorry, black girl magic and black boy joy, the concept itself is rooted in these ideas of just wanting to be represented, wanting to be seen and acknowledged as like few full human beings, right? Like black girls wanting to be seen as more than aggressive, more than tough, us wanting to take up space as just in our full humanity. I think the danger, especially in a concept like black excellence is we begin kind of falling into these patterns of what like, white supremacy and neoliberalism and capitalism recognized as black excellence. Say it so again. 
<laughs> we begin to, you know, it's like, oh, black excellence is a person who's making $200,000 a year because they invest in the stock market. Black excellence is, you know, the person who, um, has perfect grades and it begins to sort of castigate different members of our community because that's just not how it works, right? So I think the idea itself, it means well, but it, it can get twisted when we take it up in certain ways, right? Which is why within the last year, two years, I've been really weary of how I speak about it and what I support in that, that thought. Jeez, Val. Yes, just dropping in some gems. Thank you so much for that response. And I'm actually going to go to Zara for this next question in terms of something you touched on, taking up space and, um, you know, having to toe that line as to, you know, being excellent um, within within the framework of white supremacy, within the, the box of what a university is. Um, Zara, did you have any thoughts about this? Uh, and and does it how does it relate to massage and noir um your own experience as a, as a black woman in the university if you can share that with us please um sure um first of all foul that was like i couldn't have said that better that was so amazing um i think as especially as black women uh it's hard for us to take space sometimes because you're not you're almost not allowed to to sort of take up certain space you're boxed in and not just as women but also Black, black people in general and people of color in general, you're boxed in. And the, the danger with that is that, especially when you're a black woman and you're asserting yourself and you have opinions and you wanna um, speak on those opinions, there's a lot of censorship that takes place because you don't wanna come across as the angry black woman, um, which I, you know, for years I try to not to fall into that stereotype by censoring myself. And then just recently, especially after the murder of uh, George Floyd, I just started not giving a damn, right? It was just, um, yeah, I just started sort of not giving a damn because as, if you have an opinion, if you're taking up space, you're already coming across as the angry uh, black uh, woman. But I think it's really important for us to do that. And the way to sometimes to do that is to, through collective action. So like I said, I've done a lot of work with the Black Graduate Student Association and we're, you know, we're coming together um, um, we're, we're not a homogenous group. We have different uh, uh, differences of opinion, but coming together to sort of uh, advance certain causes and get into certain spaces. And we've been able to do that successfully uh, to a certain extent last year. But I think that's one way, one way to sort of do it. And obviously, because sometimes in, in, in a predominantly white spaces, when you're the only Black person, it's really hard because there's so many people that you are kind of... Uh, um, not fighting against, but you're trying to have your voice heard amongst many people that are pushing back. And sometimes in some of these spaces, I noticed that people, even though they're different, they kind of uh, have a unified voice against what you're trying to say or the issues you're trying to advance. So it's a delicate balance for sure. Yeah, no, it definitely is. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, it's it's so tricky, like just to existing, like you, like you all have been saying, like part of what I personally consider to be excellence, um, you know, not just inclusive excellence, but specifically black ex excellence is being able to, um, to show up, <laughs> to show up and just be kind of, as Val said, being your whole self, being a whole human, especially in these um, challenging spaces, which expect certain things of you. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. And you're, you're right, Zara, you've, you've been very successful as, as, as has been the BGSA. So you, you should all be proud of yourself for taking up space and, and using your voice as a black woman. Um, Michael, I'm gonna go over to you in terms of um, expectations and um, why this expression um, is somewhat challenging for us. Um, um, I don't wanna say the exact phrase because I don't wanna take the words out of, out of your mouth, but um, what are your thoughts on, on this? And, and if you have any experiences, if you could share that with us. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the self bigotry of low expectations of basically this concept that um, the expectations of you as whatever, as an academic or as a, as a student are lower just because you're, uh, just for being black, right? Um, so uh, oftentimes I'm sure everybody's experienced this where you've had some sort of achievement that basically gets um, completely blown out of proportion because people don't really expect that from you. Um, especially as, like, as an academic. So I've experienced this a couple of times, mostly in regards to scholarship and stuff like that. Um, and sort of the other side of that is uh, 
people also downplaying your your achievements and stuff like that. So um, sometimes what'll happen is uh, you'll achieve something and then um, a person may try to imply that, um, you know, you only got that because of the uh, DEI requirements, right? You only got that because you're black. You only got that because you're a woman. You only got that because you're a black woman. Um, so I have one sort of story um, related to that is- Tell us. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think this was, this was probably 2019. Um, and this also is, is sort of related to some of the imposter syndrome that I experienced sometimes. Um, so I received uh, an NSERC scholarship, uh, basically with a doctoral scholarship. This was in 2019. Ooh, yes, yes. Yeah. So the results of that, that scholarship comes out, I don't know, in, I think they come out in April, right? And basically nobody, other than my supervisor in my lab, really knew about it until maybe like September, because I could sort of kept that close to my chest. And then as soon as uh, one particular person learned that I got the scholarship, Immediately, I started hearing rumors about, you know, this person said, oh, you had, you know, you had committed fraud um, to get that scholarship. Okay. Well, um, how do you, com <laughs> how do you commit fraud and answer? Can somebody it was, tell yeah. me? It was so up <laughs> because our, uh, our, you know, you know, some universities have like quotas for how many applications they can send forward. Um, and I'm also involved in a couple committees on the, on the departmental council, but I'm not involved in the scholarship committee. Um, so basically, the rumor was that I had forwarded my own application um, somehow, even though there are other people also that have to agree to the forwarding of the application. Yet it was a it's it's long, um, uh, and yeah. And so I had to express to that person, you know, that's not like that's not. I mean, there's I can see the humor in that because I'm Nigerian, so it's it's kind of funny to be like, oh, that guy committed fraud, right? But <laughs> it's it's funny when it comes from another Nigerian, from another or Nigerian, from, right? Or from exactly. a Ghanaian, you know, like there's this Ghanaian <laughs> yeah, feud. We hate each other. Yeah, We're course. basically the same. It's funny yeah, if it comes yeah. from like from your own people. It's not that funny when it funny. comes from like yeah. someone who has no person. idea. It's just yeah, yeah. Especially when this person happened to be white. Um, yeah, especially that. Take note, folks. Don't be like that, please. <laughs> yeah. So stuff like that. And then on, on the flip side, you have people that are like, oh, wow, you know, you got that. Mind you, I think mm, there were maybe three other people that had received NSERC that year. Um, but for some reason, everybody only knew that I got it, right? They were just like, oh, you know, wow, Michael got NSERC. Oh, that's great. Um, it's just impossible. Yeah, Thank I you can't believe Michael. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's impossible. Yeah. Like you, you get an award and if you get an award, it's because you're black, but yeah. no one gives any black people awards at, <laughs> at almost ever. And so, yeah. you know, if you, you're trying your hardest and you're still not recognized. So exactly. it's just this, this it's, I'm sorry to cut you off, Michael, and, and oh, no, thank you for sharing, yeah. sharing that story. It's just, it's just so frustrating um, hearing things like this. It's like, and this is what, again, coming back to that concept of bringing your whole self, being your whole self, like yeah. what, what do people want from us like <laughs> like we just want to be able to have the same amount of education experience exactly. everything and the fact that you were saying like yeah like you're on all these committees all these committees black people are always doing the most black people are always exactly. always always doing the most especially yeah. like and not that they have to like everybody in this yeah. room is involved like very very involved in their communities and that's fine course, but yeah. i was the same in grad school i was tutoring two different organizations part of three volunteer groups working on the side yeah. like we're always I, and, I, and there's there's something to be said about that that's probably a whole separate conversation or, or maybe part of this conversation but you yeah. were it's all to say that you know we you, and let's, let's just focus on you you were doing a lot and obviously there's with the NSERC requirements like you have to have had like the other the other things that you needed as well the publications yeah, exactly. or, or conferences or whatever that whatever have you so mm -hmm. um so yeah sorry I got fired up because that that's very frustrating <laughs> for me um but yeah it's just it's it's impossible um so um, just, yeah, go ahead, Zara, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, I wanted to add that, um, the, how damaging that is to the black psyche, right? To you as an uh, individual, because a lot of times people have this um, view that if you if you get something and you're black, it's because you're black, right? And for me, it's like, for me, it's more of like, oh, because you're a woman, you're black, you're Muslim, it's all these different things. You check off all the um, diversity and inclusion criteria, but then, 
but what does that have to do with anything? I still have to, if I'm applying for a grant or, or a teaching position, I still have to have all these requirements. And I, and I think people underestimate the, how, the, the mental toll that sort of it, it takes on you because you sort of second guess yourself. Did I get this because I'm black or did I get, and you know, like you know that you didn't get it because you're black. It's because of your CV and your credentials. And, and it's the same thing even like with indigenous people. A lot of people assume that all indigenous people have free education and they have all this money to go to post-secondary um, institution where some of my um, colleagues uh, who are indigenous have zero funding because you know they're non-status or whatnot and, and they're, they're struggling, financially struggling just like everybody else. So I just wanted to add that um, the toll it takes on you as an individual, especially um, you know when you're walking into the room and a lot of people are looking at you and thinking you got this because of your race or your gender or whatnot. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for adding that. Val, you want to jump in? I was just going to say, like, just with everything we're talking about, I think in our society, and I've said this before, but it's sort of like white supremacy is one of the best engineered systems. Of oh, all time. my God. Yeah. <laughs> you are in trouble if you don't and in trouble if you do, but they make it so that you can't. Right. So either Jesus. way, like whatever direction you go into, there's going to be so many obstacles. But even when people conflate privilege with success and in our society, there's this very neoliberalist, like meritocracy way of thinking that you work hard and you um, are rewarded for working hard, which is simply not true. So then um, Zara, as you were saying, what ends up happening is black people end up internalizing these faults with the system as personal faults, right? Like we didn't get that scholarship because we are just not good. We don't know what we're doing. We weren't accepted into that program because we are like absolute trash. And it is just horrible, right? And it also makes me think of our own health outcomes as Black people. And there's research showing that for most groups, as people um, increase in their educational attainment, they have health benefits, right? You're, you're making more money, you're in different social circles. That's not necessarily true with Black people, right? So even as Black people are getting the MD degrees, the PhDs, the JDs, their health isn't reflecting that. And part of the reasoning behind that is because of the amount of work. And you're stress. To do. Exactly. And which stress is and and stress in a life, yes. So this severe stress where by the time you get your final degree, what does it matter? You're just a, a husk of a human, as, as my friends and I, and I say. It's such good points. It's, it's true. It's just that constant double think of having to always be on point and always doing your best. But if you do your best, it's like, oh, are you getting awarded because of this and that? It's impossible. You guys are amazing. And, and I appreciate all your, your points. Um, uh, I think I wanted to kind of pivot in, in talking about how this all relates to um, institutional racism. I mean, it's a, it's a big topic. How do we take that, take this on in, in, uh, 1.5 hours, uh, impossible, but yeah, it's just very challenging. Um, so when we're thinking about awards kind of jumping off of where, um, we just were with, with Michael's story, um, what, what do we think, uh, generally the university values when they're issuing awards and, um, what do we think if, if a university wants to be um, inclusively excellent or excellently inclusive, I don't know what the, the adjective is from that expression, what should they be thinking about? What are, I think Zara briefly touched on, on a few things um, in terms of different ways of knowing, et cetera, but what do we as members of the black community, you know, as, you know, as diverse as we are, think that the university should be thinking about in terms of awards and, and, and accomplishments and, and being inclusive inclusively excellent um any thoughts anybody want to jump in Zara go ahead um yeah it's it's a tricky one and I think it touches on what we were talking about earlier right because a lot of my friends were black we do a lot of you know community work just in you know in in being these spaces you and seeing some of the um, like injustices that are taking place, you can't help but be involved in your community and doing all these extra extra work. And so our CVs are full of all these community uh, work that we do and advocacy work. And and just you know, it's it's so rare to find a black student who's not involved in multiple organizations. But then when, especially at the PhD, 
that is not really valued, right? So publications and conference presentations, that's sort of, at least in my in my faculty, in my department, that's what, what is being, um, that's what's gonna get you the awards and the scholarship. So my, my, my first year, I applied for a couple of awards and scholarships and I didn't really, I, I didn't have a lot of success. So I asked for feedback and one of the committee members indirectly told me was that I didn't have enough publications. And I, and I told him, well, I know that some of the other students have publications, but they're doing more of a lit review, but I'm actually doing the work. I'm doing the work with the community, with my, you know, with the group that I'm really interested in. And this is practical work that I'm doing. But he said, that's not going to get you the awards and the scholarship. So I sort of stopped applying. I mean, I've, I've won some awards. Um, in my time here, but it, it, it's very frustrating. And, in, and uh, yeah, it is very frustrating because it's sort of uh, what, what is sort of valued, right? Um, but then it's a double-edged sword because you're doing, you're spending so much time doing community work and advocacy work and, and organizing, that takes away time for you, for you to publish, to present at conferences. And so what do you prioritize? And for me, working with communities and doing the practical work is more important than um then then i prioritize that over publishing and and conference presentation even though i'm doing both but this one is sort of more of a uh, i prioritize so it, i'm trying to find that balance in doing both because obviously as a doctoral student you're expected to 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 publish um, your your research and 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 present uh, those findings yeah it's uh it's crazy right it's what is the university value? You've, you've touched on a lot of great points. So thank you, Zara, in terms of, like we said um, with, with Michael's answer that we're looking for publications and conference presentations and all that. But it's like, if you're do, like, lit reviews are necessary. I'm not discounting the, the time and effort that goes into that. But if there's somebody with boots on the ground who's actually in the community and, and helping people in, in their specific field, why isn't that as valuable? And why, why, why aren't those types of work getting the same amount of respect um, or, or um, acknowledgement? And it's not to say that we do this work for acknowledgement, but recognition is happening in the university anyway. So if we're all applying, then why not? So I think that's something that the universities really, really do need to think about. Um, Fowler, or Michael, did you have any points to add to this idea or, or this uh, topic? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So I guess from a from a science perspective, I mean, that's it's interesting how, you know, literature review is would be viewed as, you know, more valuable than actual. Like to me, that sounds more like, you know, there's literature review and then you have, you know, original research. And then boots on the ground seems more like original research than it would be for a literature review, right? Because um, I know for, I know NSERC is doing more to make, you know, diversity and um, inclusion to make that more of a, you know, a benefit on your applications and stuff like that. But at, at the university level, I feel like it's, um, it's not really as important for awards specifically. Um, I feel like that needs to be, and I, that's how I feel about for science, at least. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about uh, in other areas, but yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for adding that. And I and I agree. I, I think that it's it's coming from the sciences myself, you know. Yeah. Um, and you know, shout out to Ansarc sponsoring this this episode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ansarc, Ansarc listen up. Yeah. You're gonna learn some <laughs> stuff too. Yeah, it's true. I think that it, we've come to a point where where the tri agencies are recognizing, like, uh oh, we need to fix this before they come for us. So. Um, yeah, the, I think someone actually shared, I'm going to share, uh, reshare this link, uh, Jane Rennie, thank you for sharing this in the chat, I'm going to share it with everybody, um, things that uh, NSERC is doing, a, a, a certain grant, I think, uh, or, or a charter that they're, they've issued, and um, part of my work that I'll be doing here, Fal Fal, I'll get to you in a second, part of my work that I'll be doing here as a postdoc, um, I've actually taken a, a short reprieve from chemistry, and I have been hired to do um, Data, data analysis for the equity, diversity, inclusion team here at Thompson Rivers University. And so um, in addition to that, I'll be doing um, some work with research data management, which is basically helping researchers to get their stuff online, whatever. Part of that is that tri-agency, that's NSERC, SHRC, and CIHR, are going to, as of March 2022, require anybody applying for these uh, awards, scholarships, grants, they have to have an EDI component. So they have to consider, it's not just an EDI statement. I will be nice to black people. No, that's not enough. You need to figure it out. Think about how diversity and inclusion and equity looks in your lab or in your office space or, 
or what have you. And it's, in a, and it's, a, and it's going to be a requirement. So I think that that will be, um, oh, currently part of the uh, doctoral application. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. So I think that that, you know, when you put the onus on the person and when you, when you attach it to money, that's really what gets people, um, gets the people going, you know, like, and, and I think that that's fine. It's unfortunate that it has, it has to come down to that. But I personally think that um, it's a good way to incentive, incentivize what people for, for years and years have been, have been calling for. Uh, Fal, please go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that all of this reminds me of an article that's been um, making the rounds on Twitter. I'm not sure who's seen it, but I think it was written by Dr. Monica McLemore in the States. And it's basically an article where she was talking about how like health equity research is um, sort of being appropriated by people who don't do the research, but because EDI is popular right now, you know, everybody um, is moving towards that. But then it also made me think of just about like CIHR shirk. I can't really speak about NSERT because I, I feel like that's, yeah, very different, um, sure. but this probably applies as well. Sometimes I think the people who get the grants and get the funding um, aside from scholarships and stuff like that tend to be, I, I feel like there's a difference in expectations based on different projects. So in the field that I'm in, social epi, social epidemiologists in Canada tend to not get a lot of research, mm -hmm. a lot of money, because it's like the mix of health and social sciences. Sure. The problem is though, a lot of applications are sort of criticized from this perspective of not really understanding why this is important for our communities, but then also holding like black indigenous people of color researchers to a standard that clearly other researchers aren't being held to if they are the ones getting the grants and we can see the projects they're putting out. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that kind of terrifies me about having or NSERC having this like EDI um, is what exactly does that mean, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for like our communities because very often people will nitpick yeah, the absolutely. few black and indigenous people they know and wanna work with. Sure. And you know, they'll check off that box. And then because everything else works well, they'll get the funding, which is absolutely not what we're asking for. Yeah. We are asking for diverse Black and Indigenous people from various ethnic, religious, sexual orientation, gender identity groups to lead the research that we need and to dictate, you know, what that research program looks like. And that is very different than the tri-council having an EDI checkbox where people are going to say, yeah, I have two Black people in my lab. Great. Right. Right. So I, it, it terrifies me because That's I want better for our research. And I just, it's, it's hard. It is hard. And you raise such, such great points. I love talking to all these smarty pants Black people because it's true. It terrifies you because Black, black people been been scared because trust is very hard. Trust is very hard after years and years and years of you know colonization and racism and all this stuff. So I mean, I think your skepticism is warranted, and I think that as a community, we we always have our eyes and ears open to what does this actually mean. I think it's a very good question, and what are they looking for? I'm hoping that. I'm hoping that ultimately it does lead to what we want. It does lead to diversity in thought, not just diversity in, in race and, and skin color and sexual orientation or whatever. It leads to diversity in, like you said, who is leading the research. And, and as you said, um, for, for your, in your particular field, um, social epidemiologists, like, yeah, it's, it's a lot of working with the communities. So community-based research is, you know, a phrase that I've been hearing a lot more often as well. Um, maybe because I've slightly stepped out of the sciences um, temporarily, but that's so important. It's so huge. Like in the end, this university is centered in a community that it's meant to serve. And so who, who, what are they researching and why, and who does it benefit? And so if we are doing research that is either coming from or will directly impact the community, then that needs to be evaluated and assessed as such. And the expectations for the people leading that research will, should look different um, than it does for somebody who, for, for example, is maybe um, only working with, you know, I don't know, archival reviews of, of literature or whatever, I, I couldn't even say. So hopefully my, my point was, I kind of rambled there. I don't, don't know where I was going, but hopefully hopefully my point was was made clear in, in that moment. Um, so thanks thanks to you guys for, for sharing all, all those those thoughts. Um, Going to take a second to, to check in with the audience after we've 
talked about inclusive excellence, maybe we've made you more confused. Um, if we could just do that third or fourth poll, I don't even know what number we're on, the poll question, Ian, um, just getting our audience to answer, what does inclusive excellence mean to them or what do they think it means? Um, and then we will keep on, keep on, keep it on. There we go. Yeah, it's just, it's really fascinating. Um, I, 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 I'm, I think we uh, foul you rightfully, rightfully afraid about what, what this means and what information will be collected. And um, yeah, a part of my challenge in my new role is like, if, if I'm going to be looking at equity data and diversity data, getting people to, to self-identify. So as Zara had mentioned, like, um, you know, there's these, some stereotypes about, you know, these indigenous scholars get this and that and this and that, but a lot of people will not, either will not self-identify or self-report, or they, for whatever reason, don't have status. And that's a whole interesting, um, complicated and, and, and a horrendous uh, system of colonialism as well. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the, what the outcome will be fell, but, uh, Maybe, maybe we'll have a chat at the Good Bad Black Grad Reunion in 10 years when I'm old and gray and <laughs> reflect, on, reflect on what's happened. <laughs> Ian, how are we doing for numbers? Uh, we're just uh, at a minute and 15 seconds and we have 65%. Okay, well. You wanna show the results? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. There we are. Okay, so disruption, belonging, community, Nobody said confusion. <laughs> that was probably probably uh, intimidating for people. I think that it's a bit it's a bit of all these things, which is why I've listed it. Um, um, uh, oh, we have a Jonathan Turner saying I might have answered that poll question differently until I hear heard John Powell speak last year. Does anybody know who John Powell is? Because I don't know. Um, Jonathan Turner, do you want to do you want to um, pop in quickly and tell us what you're talking about? If you're not if you're not um, in a noisy or random area. Oh, he shared us. He shared us a, a link. Okay, cool. Oh, okay. It looks like there's some kind of discussion happening in the chat. There's some friendships happening or something. That's good. Um, I'm just gonna turn it over to our panelists um, just quickly uh, before we check in with our professor. Um, is there anything that you wanted to say or or or? Um, discuss before before we have a, our, our prof jump jump in any thoughts maybe um no zara i just maybe i'll pick on you yeah go ahead sure. um i think inclusive um excellence is a great concept just like edi on paper and and i genuinely want to believe that institutions are doing something about it and they really care about this right but it involves more than just having like i said people um at the table right like just to say that yeah we we have this number of black students or black faculty whatever may be the case but you need to look at how you're including these people because many black faculty end up leaving institutions right like in my department when i started we had um, one black faculty, um, she retired, um, um, and and then we haven't been able to successfully hire anybody else, right? But you bring people into the space, but then how are they doing in that space, right? Because when you're experiencing lots of racism, when your voices are, are not being heard, when your ways of knowing and um, it, it's not being appreciated, then there's no point of just adding more people just to say we have more people. So it's more than it's more than it's more than numbers, even though our numbers numbers are really low, but it is way more than uh, uh, numbers. And I think institutions need to do a better job to ensuring that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are coming to space, spaces that are um, spaces that are healthy, uh, spaces where they are valued and where they can do their work, go on do their work. Because we spend a lot of time trying to fight white supremacy and racism than to, to actually do, doing our own work. So it's a bur additional burden that the institutions really need to work toward it. Because right now it looks, for me, it's coming across as just a buzzword rather than a tangible policy that they're trying to see uh, come to fruition. Well, the people in the back, yes, that buzzwords. That's what I'm feeling about this inclusive excellence. Like I, I, I know that I um, am in an opportunity, like a position of opportunity where maybe that will look different um, at this institution in another two to, to 10 years. But yeah, we, I, I really do hope that we move beyond um, terms on paper to something that, that like helps the university and helps the communities that the universities serve. Val, you're done, unit. Um, please go ahead. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, and I, I think I was trying to say this, but Zara reminded me of it, is also it relates to what Michael brought up, the soft bigotry of low expectations. The flip and related side to that is also expecting Indigenous, Black, and like other racialized people to answer for things we simply can't in our research that other people don't necessarily have to do. So like a project on anti-Black racism now needs to like fix institutional anti-Black racism and needs to do A, B, and C. And right, where other projects and other people who are doing that work and getting that funding in those awards aren't being like held to the same standard or, you yeah. know, critiqued in that way. So it also just made me think like, trust these communities and knowing how to do the work and obviously, you know, evaluating them rigorously, but also understanding that you don't know how to do that all the time. Absolutely. And it has to look different, right? Like, these people are these people whatever the they these the people on who sit on awards committees and and are decision makers um if the right people aren't in the room there's they might not have the perspective of what what or why new voices and new research and new leading researchers look different than everybody else and so trusting the work and trusting uh new different uh, ideas and you know I guess in, in a way taking a risk, I think, you know, big risk, big reward. So yeah, thanks for saying that. I'm just gonna read this comment before we move on. Um, Jari, uh, Tari had said, um, this often comes up in job applications. The EDI statements put the onus on us rather on the institutions to change. One job I applied for asked for three separate EDI statements. It feels like a buzzword exercise, absolutely. It's just, it's a lot, it's a lot. So uh, I, I don't know. Um, we'll see, we'll see what this looks like. I think it's like the, the pendulum swing, you know, it's like universities had, were just like quite silent for, for all of, all of time. And now it's like, uh, EDI and, uh, and an inclusive excellence and, and, and an EDI statement and buzzwords and all the things, Michael, you've unmuted. Uh, yeah, I was gonna, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, cause I really, I like that comment. I agree with it. <clears throat> it's like, we're expected to, as black people, especially I noticed with black women also, <clears throat> that you're kind of expected to be an expert on EDI. So uh, no matter what you, no matter what the, the problem is or what the, um, what the dilemma, like you're expected to know the answers right away and know exactly what needs to be done to address EDI and, and you're expected to have three separate EDI statements just for, for one job and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I like the way that comment was worded. Yeah, Tari's great. Thanks like for, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks, Michael. And, and thanks, Tari. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's like, well, but I'm a chemist, like, I don't know. you know. Right? And so, yeah, I think there has to be similar expectations across the board and not just for, for people of color, you know, um, uh, and black people. So I'm gonna give our current panelists a break and we're gonna move on to our next segment, Petition to Prof. So uh, we have here with us today, um, Dr. Cheryl Thompson, sorry, I'm going to read out your bio, Dr. Thompson. Uh, so Dr. Cheryl Thompson is an assistant professor in creative industries at the Creative Industry School at Ryerson University. She's the author of Uncle, Race, Nostalgia, and the Politics of Loyalty, and also the author of Beauty in a Box, Detangling the Roots of Canada's Black Beauty Culture, which was uh, published in 2019. Dr. Thompson is currently working on her third book on Canada's history of Blackface as perform of performance and anti-Black racism. And uh, in 2021, this year, Dr. Dr. Thompson was a recipi recipient of an Ontario Early Researcher Award um, titled uh, Mapping Ontario's Black Archives Through Storytelling. This project aims to catalog Ontario's Black archival collections and through ethnographic interviews with the province's creative community, it collects stories about the collections that will culminate with a public exhibition, uh, exhibition excuse me, curated by Dr. Thompson and her research team. She holds a, a PhD in communication studies from McGill University, and she previously held a Banting postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto Centre for Theatre, Drama and Performance Studies, as well as the University of Toronto Mississauga's Department of English and Drama. So this year, Dr. Thompson was named to the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists. She is obviously a superstar. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, at the same time, I listen to all these black grad students and understand I received no funding as a grad student. Mm. Every show. Wow, isn't that crazy? So you read <laughs> that everything you just read was after I got my PhD. Wow. Hey. Like during my PhD, it was not silence. <laughs> and so but that didn't prevent me from winning a banting. Yeah, that it's crazy. From becoming a professor. Yeah. That didn't prevent me from writing two books, one of which I actually started 
really during before I started my PhD. So wow. I've always been a person who's been more focused. I, I actually saw this on a TED talk. There was a young African American woman who gave a TED talk recently that I'm actually going to show in my class because Ooh. I love to show content of Black people in my class. I don't yes, care what yes, it is. Always. And and she said, you know, we need to shift from purpose to wellness. Mm. And this drive and purpose and doing this, it's actually making people sick. Yeah. Right? As opposed to putting your wellness first, what feeds you, what makes you feel good. If you're working on a project, do it because it's making you feel good, not because you want a grant. Mm -hmm. It's like having now sat on grant, like I sit on some of those same shirk committees, not NSERC, but I've sat on shirk committees. I've adjudicated applications. So I actually know, I know the insider scoop of what actually gets funded and what doesn't and why and all that. And, and to base your entire existence on getting a grant, maybe because I came out of an experience where I never got any, and I just learned to find wholeness in myself in the absence of that kind of validation. I just know that in the long run, that's what gets you through the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's so hard though. Like as, as just having finished grad school myself, not just, it's been a year. I keep saying just, I'll probably say just for my entire life, but having finished grad school myself recently, it's, and I, I also didn't receive any large scholarships. It just, for me personally, I can't speak to anybody else, but for me personally, having been so successful, successful, academically successful coming into grad school, it was very hard for me mentally. Like I couldn't, I couldn't adjust. I was like, I am not an award winner. Therefore I am nothing. And no, it, it's, me, it is, it's so hard. Tough. Yeah. I must yeah. say it's easy. I yeah. mean, and I was saying a lot of prayers in many languages, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> often wondering how am I going to live? Like there were many mm -hmm. years where I'm, you know, I'm living below the poverty line. I'm like, how am I going to just basic, basic necessities, food, clothing, shelter were yeah. on my mind as I'm trying to write a dissertation. Yeah. And I see my white colleagues who are not even worried about any of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Those stresses are gone. Right. And so then we wonder when we graduate with these degrees, why it seems like black racialized indigenous people have a death are working in a deficit model where mm -hmm. it's like we're always trying to like do it's because we spent how many years of our grad school actually behind our quote unquote peers because they didn't have to worry about any of the things that we have to worry about. And yet we're sitting up in the classroom like we're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, we're all classic. getting a PhD. And it's like, no, our PhDs are not that's going to be the same. When mm -hmm. I'm done, I'm here's some facts. I'm still paying off my debt. Okay. Facts. I still have lots of debt. Even mm -hmm. as I make a high salary and people want to say that I'm quote unquote rich, well, let's define wealth because it doesn't feel like, like I'm rich just based mm -hmm. on what I had to do to get this quote unquote money. So, you know, I, but hearing you all have these conversations, you're, you're definitely saying things that when I was a grad student, like 10 years ago, I wish I had people to talk to <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't really have anyone to talk to And I went to the McGill McGill at the time when I was a grad student, this is not a, this is not a joke. This is, this is not a joke. There were three black students in the faculty of arts. So the faculty Whoa. of arts, that's all the, all the disciplines in arts. Maybe that's three to, I don't know, 2000, 3000, three, there were Stop. three of us. Stop this right now. <laughs> okay. So I wouldn't even know where to, I didn't know where to find community. There was no community. Like it was it was a very isolating experience and it was made even sometimes more isolating to be honest sometimes black faculty mm. let's just say they they didn't always help me out either it was a tough mm -hmm. yeah it was a tough yeah, that's complicated that's complicated that it is a discussion for like the next the next generation of yeah, so, black academics you know yeah so what i learned to do was i learned to help myself and then i committed if i were to get a position at a university that I was not going to do the same thing to my students. Yes. Absolutely. I was going to be a different type of person. You have to make a decision. If you don't, you just become that person. I really believe that. If you just let it happen, then you will fall into all the toxicity and all the stuff. So it has to be a conscious, willful decision to not do unto others what was done to you. This is amazing. Um, two things. We have a uh, Vincent Mosso saying, He's from McGill and the School of Social Work hired their first black professor the same year they celebrated their 100th anniversary. Wow. 
Wow. Wow. Wow. Wow. Wow. Wow. That's number one. Number two is we are so again, just bringing it back to the theme or forcing it back to the theme, I guess, in terms of inclusive excellence. Like, what do you, what do you think about this expression? And is it an expression being used like in your university or in your circles generally, like just thoughts generally? Yeah. So first of all, in terms of quote unquote EDI, at my institution, we've actually started using ECI. So that's equity, community and inclusion mm, okay. and getting out this diversity word that I think is just like, what does it mean? Question marks. Yes. It's like, it doesn't mean anything. And really, so black, what, what was it again? Black inclusive excellence. Oh, oh it's um. so the, the expression is inclusive excellence. We've spoken about black excellence as a as a tangent just within this this room but i think the universities are are in, in their strategic plans and in a lot of different like high level documents is uh, it's included as almost like a, a tenant or a, a goal yeah. of inclusive excellence and we're like what is this so yeah i mean i kind of agree with some of the things that people said i think excellence like black excellence there's so much i think it was val who said this about the way that we attach excellence to wealth attainment Mm. and like a lifestyle we say oh they that's black excellence because they're rocking a, a rolex and a, like a yeah, beamer whatever. like i don't know like is that is that the only to me excellence and it, it again it ties into um it, it should emanate from inward out so i think about people who i look up to like these are people who are centered who have wisdom who are not making hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they're living the life they want to live. To me, you know what, discontent, like unhappiness in life is really a not about your state of being. It's not really not about whether you have money or you don't have money. It's actually about whether your internal thought matches your external experience. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. Mm -hmm. And whether or not your surroundings, you're content in what, for, with what you have. Most times, that's why people have all this money and they're like, why, why are you unhappy? You're making 10 million <laughs> because that money doesn't mean anything because inside there's nothing going on. It's a dead zone. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I, 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 and I'll, I can't remember, I think Val, you also said this. I was listening when you talked about, <laughs> when you talked about the neoliberalization of the university and the idea of cloaking success on individual um, ability to achieve or failure if you don't do well. Well, let's think about it. Isn't excellence tied into that word is tied into that same narrative mm, because who do we celebrate as excellence? That's going to be on a hierarchy and Absolutely. it's going to be ranked. And Absolutely. of course, if it's at the university, there's going to be metrics. Now there's going to be mm -hmm. metrics attached to what is excellent. Mm -hmm. And then now you're going to have committees that are formed. It's like the black excellence committee. <laughs> that's going to have all these <laughs> to decide yeah, yeah, and so right? then it's going to turn into the same opera i call it the operationalization of race mm -hmm. and how then we get pitted against each other in terms of who is good and who's worthy and the whole idea that's tied into neoliberalism so for me i just think um i don't like those terms <laughs> i don't like the term yeah. excellence i don't like the, i don't like any of them i just think to me and, and at the same time i've had i've had a a mixed uh, relationship with the word joy, like black joy. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I recently like, I don't know about that either. <laughs> like some of Ooh. these, so there's a lot of them that I'm kind of like, uh, 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 and I just feel like we're in a growing pains Absolutely. moment. So maybe it'll be a while until we get to that thing that everybody convalesces around and says, okay, I think this is it. Like mm -hmm. right now, I feel like we're just trying out a lot of different names and tags. And for some people it works. And for some people it, it just doesn't work. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You just, uh, just saying so much, Dr. Thompson, I can't even, <laughs> I'm just like processing. I can't even, um, do, do any of our panelists have any, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, do any of our panelists have any questions for Dr. Thompson, um, or, um, the audience? Uh, yeah, ask me anything. I mean, you can ask me about <laughs> grants. Like, I mean, here's a chance if you want to know. Ask me about all the things that maybe you don't feel like you can ask your supervisor. Like, I'll just tell you the truth because <laughs> I don't have any stakes in the game. Yeah, no, you're great. And I've been just here and there keeping in touch with you. And thank you for being here. Val, you have a question. Let's all listen. Um, yeah, I just have a question as somebody who's looking towards doctoral studies because right now I'm out of school. <laughs> um, and yeah, just finishing things up. 
I feel like I completely understand with not basing our worth and our value on these grants and scholarships because you can't right at the end of the day when you apply you don't know <laughs> what's going to happen but then it also makes me think of like as you said trying to survive like when you're in it in the moment not getting that like scholarship yeah is a difference between like you paying rent and you not having to work to and I'm sure most of us can like relate to literally my entire master's experience I was thinking I've had to work two or three jobs at like, <laughs> yeah. all times. My And I'm just like, yeah, but everybody I know who's Black <laughs> does the same thing, right? So it's sort of like in the moment, I guess, how do you deal with that aside from just working those jobs and moving forward? Well, I mean, it's very tough. I mean, the thing that helped me understand that my first book was my dissertation. So that was the project that I worked on when I was like ramen noodles and mac and cheese for dinner because, right? So that's that's what it led to was the book. And then it took another five years to actually revise the dissertation so it could be a book. And so in all that time, at a certain point with grants, I started to use them as like, okay, let me at least get the feedback. <laughs> like maybe they could give me some guidance and like, and then what I realized, and this is advice I still give young people today stop reaching for the moon reach for what's in front of you get the 5000 grant apply for that and then look you got it get the 10000 apply for that stop going and thinking if you don't get the mega something for 4 years you're nothing so i i that's what i did eventually i played the short game so in my third year or so my phd i got a $10000 grant then i there was a museum fellowship I'm not in art history. I don't know nothing about museums. And yet I won the grant. I just went for it. And I had an original project that was 20,000. And then I started to get 5,000, seven here, 7,500. So even me telling you, I didn't win any major grants. That's true. But I still found little patches of funding. And I think that's the game that people don't tell you because often there are these little grants that they're begging people to apply for ah, because nobody's really? applying. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's how you play the game to get like grant money and then build your confidence to that. Okay. Maybe I do. I do deserve to be here. I can make something of this. So that's my, that's my major tip. Okay, very good tips here. I think Zara had a question and then we have one from Tari from the audience. And also, sorry, you know, just quickly, also remember there are community grants too. Yeah, looking outside of university too outside does help. I was going to say, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> many community grants, especially now there's actually a lot of organizations. As much as we could talk about, okay, yeah, they're just trying to get on the Black Lives Matter train. If there's money behind that, take it. Get it. Because get it. In, another, in another five years, that could be gone. Okay. It's true. So, so, so look for those opportunities too. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thompson. That, I really liked your, you know, short, it was short, but really powerful talk. I, I, my question, I just have a question. How are you surviving um, as, 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 a, as a prof in your institution? Like how, what are you doing to sort of maintain your mental health and sanity? Yes, and I hope you can, you can, you can feel my vibration through the interface. It's very high. I'm I feel vibrant, it. I can feel vibrant. it. I can feel it. And the reason is, is because I surround myself that with people who are also on my same energy. Like I started understand in grad school, I started my own kind of like I would call it a spiritual practice, where I really got to know myself. Why am I ask myself the questions? Why am I doing this? What do I want out of life? Who do I want in my life? And it also meant I had to let some people go some people who might our blood relation, some of those people, because I wanted to create a circle. You have to, how am I doing? I have a circle that is warm and loving and caring and concerned about my well-being that actually wants to know how I'm doing, not what I'm working on. And then I just create a vortex <laughs> that keeps those people close and keeps the other people out. And so in academia, whether you're a grad student or a prof, you actually have to do that. You have to create a shield to keep certain people away from you. There's faculty. I am in, a, in my same school. I have colleagues I, I literally haven't spoken to in two years. Like we're sitting in meetings. I don't look at them. 
we have and why because that toxicity i'm trying to keep out my vortex it's not because i have any well i do have an issue with them so it is rooted in something but instead of doing what the mistake that a lot of black faculty do is that they go into these schools and they're on a mission to make sure everybody knows that i'm here and and suddenly they start fighting all these people and there are all these battles and the truth is it's going to make you sick yeah, so you, i have you know. i have approached my practice as an educator from a lens of wellness and that lens of wellness means that I put me first so even the other day yesterday for example a, a student came and asked me if I wanted to sit on their comps committee we had a meeting I first thing I said was who else is on the meet on the committee as soon as I heard the names I said to them I'm sorry but no <laughs> and then because I know the student I was very honest with them I said it's because I believe in wellness. And if I have to interact with those individuals that will take away from my wellness. And so how I survive and I keep this kind of vibration is that I make very clear choices about who I work with, who I talk to and who I give my time to. Mm -hmm. And often mm -hmm. people walk into these institutions and they're an open door. <laughs> think about your house you leave the door open yes the little cat might come in but the raccoon the rats the mice a snake might wander in like that's what's gonna happen <laughs> dr thompson you're always here giving us the analogies <laughs> I, spoke with doc, I spoke with dr thompson last week somehow the analogy involved a whale and a shark oh, and, yes. a, and a that's goldfish right. <laughs> i could share that same analogy yes because when you end up in academia if that's if that's where you want to be I use the analogy with Evelyn that you're in an ocean and the ocean is an amazing place because you have hunters, predators and prey in the same ocean coexisting. So you have the sharks and you have the dolphins <laughs> and they coexist. Dolphins don't try to run and play with the sharks because they know they'll get killed. Right. And at the same time, the sharks leave those dolphins alone because they're like those. Look at those dolphins. They're, they don't they can't even do anything. They don't have any power. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to be a shark or a dolphin. Like in this analogy, you want to be a whale. Okay? Wow. And that's what I said to her, because <laughs> a whale, they don't business with any of those people. You hardly even see them. They stay under the ocean. And when they do come up, you're like, oh my God, look, it's a whale. It's so amazing because you never see them. They mind their business. And so if you want to survive in an institution, you do want to act like a big, great white whale. And look at just that. mind your business, but take up a lot of space with your work. Because at the end of the day, that's what gets you tenure. It's your it's work. Great. You're just, I can't, I can't with you, Dr. Thompson. You're so amazing. Now we have all these questions. Here we go. <laughs> I'm giving you guys facts. I, I'm not filtered. Girl, you are giving, you're giving me like just life facts. I don't, I don't know all the things we have. A but question but from, quickly. Yeah, go ahead, please. You know, go ahead. Zaro, know that it's tough. I'm not trying to put on any like kid. I'm not trying to put on kid gloves. You know, this is a very tough profession to, to choose. And, and it's not easy, but if it's a calling, know that any job you choose that feels like a calling is never going to be easy. Absolutely. Wow. Well, we have, um, we have a question from Tari who says, thanks so much, Dr. Thompson. I'm a huge fan of your work. I have a question about the wave of cluster focused hires, cluster, cluster or focused hires for black professors. How long do you think this moment might be, might be for universities to push for more black faculty and what challenges or opportunities do you think this hiring pattern might present for black faculty who are already in institutions mm. coming with the big big questions like, child do you remember gangster rap <laughs> remember when that was a thing <laughs> damn that's what this feels like to me it feels so but at the same time it it's interesting because in the 1990s like i'm old enough to remember like when i was a student in the 90s they were doing the same thing with indigenous faculty mm, okay there was like a, always like the, like a lot of the indigenous faculty and like the space now that's at universities for indigeneity. It started in the nineties, lots of cluster hires and look, look where we are today, tomorrow, they have a national holiday that's being celebrated. And there, and, and there's a lot of academics who are behind that happening. It's not just these like altruistic government officials right. suddenly deciding no oh, we're gonna be nice to black people today no yeah, it's because you have tenured indigenous faculty with posts and 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 established at many different institutions who literally have made this happen 
right? Black faculty, we're still at the point of like, can we get in? Can, can you, <laughs> hello? And so yeah. to me, I say it is a moment. And I know a lot of a lot of black grad students are thinking, oh God, when I'm ready to go on the market, is it, are they just going to all be gone? Like there's that sense of like, but right. again, that's the logic of capitalism. Exactly. The logic of capitalism runs on scarcity to mm -hmm. always make you think there isn't enough. Is enough. Yeah. And I always go back to the pandemic. Didn't they say before the pandemic, we just don't have the money for that. Suddenly it was like, how much money has been spent? <laughs> like, they've been spending tens of millions. Like I'm thinking, yes. are they printing? Is the queen printing money out of the palace and shipping it? Like, where's the money coming from? So don't believe the hype of scarcity. Okay. The truth is there's always hires. Look at me. When I was on, when I was end of like second year of my postdoc, people were like, oh, what are you going to do? I was like, what do you mean I'm going to do when I'm ready to, I, I, but then again, I deeply believe this. You know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. When I'm ready for something, I just know it's going to be there. So when I was doing my postdoc, I was like, I'm not worried about jobs, but I'm ready to look for a job. They will appear. And if they didn't, <laughs> right? if they yeah. didn't appear. So part of this also, the scarcity mindset also gets you to not believe in yourself and to mm -hmm. also not have faith that things will be in place when you need them to be in place. You have to just quiet all that noise and believe that when you're ready to be hired for a position, the positions will appear. I feel like Dr. Thompson has to like host like a like a sister circle, like a sister circle meditation support <laughs> group. <laughs> like where you just yeah, we just where we're like, okay, we're here to listen to whatever you say. Like everything you're saying is really, really like resonating with me. And it sounds like advice that my my older sister will like, she's like, just believe it'll happen. What's meant for you will be for you. Stay open. And I'm like, but I suck. It's really, but really I only suck. know that because I've lived it. I'm not telling you something I saw in a movie or I read in a book. Understand I'm coming from Jamaican parents came here, worked hard, 50 plus years. They did not get the luxury of going to university. Mm -hmm. I am the first person in my family to go to university. I went to public school in Scarborough, Ontario. Yes. Tell I, mean, I, I don't fit the profile to have ended up at McGill, right? So I know how I got there. And I didn't get there by doing something backhanded <laughs> or sneaky or deceitful. I got there because I believe in myself. I believe in my work and I have faith in, in, a, in a being beyond me that when I'm ready to achieve something, it will show up. Man, thank you, Dr. Thompson. I just want now, to- Now, mind you, if I could have the same mentality in the dating realm, man, <laughs> it would have spared me. It would spare me so much, so much time and energy. Listen, listen, Dr. Thompson, we're, we're still out here single as hell. So it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be part of our next sister circle. We cannot even get into oh. that today. I'm just going to say that we are at the end of our 90 minutes, but I don't want to stop the conversation. If we can just do another five to 10 minutes with Dr. Thompson and with the panelists, if you have it. Yeah. That's um, and and uh, audience members are still here, which means that they're engaged because like I said, you are a magical guru. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so if we could just stay a little bit longer to just wrap up some of these questions. Um, okay. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, we have, I'm going to skip over Kara's question because Kara's my friend and she would not be mad at me. And I'm going to go to a different question which um, is here by uh, Prof Collins, who's another friend, of course. And he says, excuse me, the redefinition of what constitutes excellence is a great point. And um, his question is, why should black indigenous and other racialized groups be tasked with that responsibility? Our people have only just gotten through the door, whereas our white counterparts have dominated these spaces and reaped the benefits for such a long time. Um, we might have already touched on that, but please. Well, no, I mean, also understand that the word excellence only gets attached to Black, Indigenous, and racialized people, whereas white people are normal. Mm. Mm. But we have to what be is standard. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's like, and yet normal is still doing things that you would think they were excellent, but you're kind of like, mm, okay, how yeah. did you get that? Because I'm out here <laughs> killing it and, I, and I'm going doing overtime <laughs> and you're out here barely trying and it's like, look who's promoted to vice mm. president. And you're like, what? <laughs> Michael's out here just like, make it make sense. Make it so, make sense. So to me, I think the, all of those terms need to be rethought. And I think excellence is a problem. Just, it's just by its nature, it's a problematic concept. Um, you know, but, but I understand why, but I, but I context, like I understand where it's coming from, because if you're someone, anyone who went to school prior to the 1990s, really, because it's really in the 1990s where things I think 
started to shift a little bit structurally before the 1990s. I remember in my school, no one ever told me I was good at anything. Mm -hmm. Like I was never celebrated for anything. In fact, believe it or not, I was told I wasn't university material, that I couldn't do that. Everything was deficit. I, I didn't, I wasn't good at this. So I don't know if you'll do that. So there was just a lot that you didn't feel excellent going to school. Like you just felt like, why am I here? Mm -hmm. So that's where the language I think came from. It was like to counter that those experiences but here we are 20 plus years later and it's like it's just not it's just not working yeah no it's challenging it's challenging um we have another question maybe our last one unless the panelists have questions for you which i'm sure they do because we could say it with you forever but um the question i'd skip from my friend kara she says thanks so much for your discussion um dr thompson could you expand on your issues with the term black joy <laughs> She's like, Jesus, today I can't do it. You know what I have an issue with? Well, I'm, I'm very big on words. Like in my classes, like, like you had a discussion about what are people doing for Truth and Reconciliation Day? I'm not canceling my class. Instead, I'm taking up space to explain to people what truth and reconciliation mm -hmm. actually means. Sure, absolutely. Because I think a lot of people don't know what that call is actually. No, right, absolutely. And they're not going to use the day for healing and learning. They're just like, oh, I got a day of school. Let's, you guys want to go to the movies? <laughs> so I'm like, I told people, come to class because we're going to actually talk so that people could get the knowledge. But mm -hmm. I believe in words, black and joy. Understand that joy is a fleeting experience. Mm -hmm. The only people who experience joy perpetually are drug users. <laughs> That's why they're that's why they're always on a chase because they want to keep perpetual yes, joy. Absolutely, absolutely. Joy is not meant to be sustainable. No. It's not sustainable. That's why you that's why you appreciate it when you're in joy. You appreciate it so much because it's not an emotion that is meant to be felt every hour of every single day. And now we want to attach that to black. Mm. And like your state of being and your identity. I just think the words are in contradiction, mm -hmm. right? And it's mm -hmm. like, anytime I hear Black Joy, I'm like, well, that's going to last for a minute. And then what? Okay. Yeah. Like what comes after the joy? Like the work, the doing, the community, the being, the empowerment. Like there's so many other words that we can use that actually speak to a state of permanent permanency, right? Like joy is not a permanent state of being. And yet we've attached it to ourselves <laughs> in this way that I just think is, is really problematic. And, and so for me, I, I don't use it anymore. I, mm -hmm. I'm looking at many different words, Black empowerment, Black beingness, Black wellness, I feel is even better, Black self-care, things that are actionable and things that are sustainable. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do you, any of the panelists have any final questions before we sadly have to wrap up here no uh, sure. I, have, I have not heard from you michael Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you uh, professor thompson yeah i haven't asked any questions yet but i've i've drawn something from basically everything you said answering everybody else's question um so i appreciate that uh my question is mostly related to so i'm i'm currently writing applications for uh for postdoc fellowships and stuff like that yeah um so my question is related to your journey uh, looking for a a uh, faculty position um, as a black academic. So what are some what are some things that you you think that other black academics should look out for during that search? Well, the first thing that I that I really I know when I was on the job market, I, I tried to be uh, well, one I had I actually had a white ally who helped me with all my documents with the cover letter, with the research statement, the teaching dossier. I didn't know what to do. And they took time out of their life and they helped me so that I had, so no, the first advice is to get, get a mentor, somebody who will give you time, who's been through the process, who can actually help you. Then the second thing is that uh, I had to be very clear about what I did and be un unapologetic about it. I did not want to get a job where I could not talk about race, where I couldn't show up as myself, but look, I got this tenure track job. At the end of the day, that's just going to make me sick. So I was kind of like, I just had to, again, I had to make a decision <laughs> that this is me. This is the work I do. Does it fit with what you're looking for? Do we get on? And I, I just did that. I, I drew a line in the sand. So I didn't, I, when I was on the market, I didn't apply for many jobs because naturally that is not going to fit, <laughs> right? A lot of the jobs, but 
because I believe that the jobs would show up, they did. And the jobs that did show up, and I can tell you for my present job, this was the only application that when I saw the job posting, I actually texted a friend at the time and said, I found my job. I'm, so, I'm actually sounding like a real African. I'm sounding like a Ghanaian right now. This is my job. <laughs> I, I found my job. Hey, <laughs> this is my job right here. <laughs> but it's true. I just looked at it. It's like, this is my job. I knew. I knew with such weird clarity, this was my job. This was my school. I'm getting this job. And every step of the process, the long interview, the job talk, I was like, this is my job. <laughs> I just, I felt it in such a profound way. With all the other ones, it wasn't like that. I was kind of like, I don't know how this is going to go or maybe, but for some reason, I just felt it. And so, and, and so it's not a surprise that since this job, it seems like Cheryl Thompson is everywhere. <laughs> He is, and she's here with us today. We're so blessed. But I think it's because it was just such a match. And, and when you find a match in your life, it's like a flower just blossoms, right? It's like everything just works. So that's my story. The key to being on the job hunt is to understand that your story is going to be different. Don't use me as the template and don't use anyone else. Your story is going to be different, but no, it's only going to be to your benefit to be yourself. You're just, yeah. you're honestly, it's just, you're the best. You're the best, Dr. Thompson. Everybody's so glad that you're here. I, I, the truth uh, is, I'm not, the truth is the Yes, you me. are. No, I, no. If you really knew, back in the high school days, people be like, who? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not necessarily the best, but I just try to be honest. I live in integrity. And it doesn't mean that has, that's not always been my, my selling point. Because most people live in a, in a delusion. They don't want, <laughs> they don't want the truth. They want lies and uh, an image of something. I don't have time for that. So because I live in integrity and I always kind of tell people exactly, you know, what I would tell anyone, you know, people have this reaction and I do appreciate it. It does not go to my head because, you know, at the end of the day, I just believe that I will succeed when I see more of you who look like me in these institutions. Amazing. <laughs> That's only going to help me out. Let's hope so. <laughs> Let's hope so. Let's hope so that we will all meet in, like I said, another 10 years when I have more grays and we'll just be supporting each other. Um, you honestly, thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for being You're here. Um, I just have one more point before we let everybody go. Um, if you could share, I don't know if you have on, on, on your person, the link to the Ted talk or, um, that you were talking about with that you're going to share in class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have, or you can, you know what, you can email it to me and I'll email, yeah, it, to I'll email it to you. It's, yeah. Um, it, it, and then she's, she's also, you know, it was a story about her grandmother and going to Trinidad and loss and, and, and death and, and renewal and life. I mean, it, I, I played it and I was getting a little like choked. I just hope my 300, like mostly white students feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all hits, them, hits them in the feels, right? That's how we get, that's how we I get think so. Changed. Because the truth mm -hmm. is, why wouldn't a story coming from an African-American woman, why can't that be a universal story? Why does yeah. it have to be a story just for us because we look mm -hmm. like her? When, mm -hmm. when I'm presented with a white speaker, they don't say, well, this is just for white people. I hope everybody <laughs> else can understand it. They don't have to give that disclaimer. <laughs> Whenever it's us, they're like, okay, I'm just letting you know it's, it is a black speaker. I hope everyone, <laughs> somebody actually said that once and I'm like, are we aliens? Like we, we speak, are we, is it English? If it's English, then everyone here who's yeah, English yes, should be English. able to understand yeah. Yeah. and relate to it. So I just believe when we talk just quickly, we talk about diversity and we talk about diversification. Somebody told me that they were in a grad class and it was a white professor and they were like, they were all about diversity. So they, they presented some they like in, decolonized the syllabus and they did all that. And yet every guest speaker they brought into the class was white. <laughs> what? How? How? This, Sway? Is, this, is what, How? this is what we mean. This is what we mean. <laughs> Yeah. You, this has been Miss the Mark. My sister Stacey is here to miss the mark. You guys have been amazing. Thank you all so, so much for being here. The, I mean, the, the audience members, like till the last moment, we basically retained everybody who we started with. So thank you again, Michael, Zara, Fal, Dr. Thompson. You guys are amazing. With that, I'll say, you know, thank you for joining and we'll see you guys all in November. Don't forget to reflect tomorrow. CRC day. Take care, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>